Hello, welcome to CM Videos, a YouTube channel dedicated to helping you get started with computational modeling. And also, we're here to curate FES solutions, to curate solutions for your finite element modeling problems. This video is dedicated to teaching you about the theory of periodic boundary conditions. And the video is essentially about teaching, teaching about this, talking about the theory. There will be other subsequent videos that you would have to look at to teach you a bit more about how to actually implement periodic boundary conditions in Abacus or in FEA tools within using a manual method or an automatic method. Please do look out for the links on the cards for those two videos. If this is the kind of content that you like, please do subscribe to this channel so that when content like this are made, you'll be the first to see it. And also, please, if you like this content, I encourage you to click the like button uh, so that words about this, these videos continue to spread so that other people would, would see it. If there's again any video uh, that you would like me to make along these lines or other kind of lines, I do want to hear from you. So please use the comment section in the comment and, and you will get more information about, um, about this. So please do use that. So let's jump straight ahead into the content of, of this, this lecture. So the first thing is periodic boundary condition types. So within finite element modeling, there are different periodic boundary condition types. And if you're new to this and this is old stuff, please do jump into the timestamp and move to things that you really want. But for those that are not fully aware, I'll just run through some of these different types of finite element boundary conditions. So the first of them is the Dirichlet boundary condition, which is things like displacement temperature. These are values that you apply directly onto the nodes and then they will displace at a constant at a defined value. Um, so it's kind of one of the commonest boundary condition types. Some people describe it as a first type boundary condition. The second bit is the Newman boundary condition, which again is slightly different from the Dirichlet. There are things like pressure, the attraction, the forces across domains, so they're usually a result of, of a value crossing through a domain, like flux. So these are Newman boundary conditions. Then there is a mid-mode boundary condition, which is basically a combination of the Dirichlet and the Newman. And then finally, we have the periodic boundary condition, so which is the object for this this video, this teaching. And I and I want to dive deeply on this periodic boundary condition. And the main reason why is that all the other type of boundary conditions are kind of easier to implement within a finite element scheme because there's always a, a button that you will click and it will help you to implement them. But unfortunately for periodic boundary conditions, they're not easy to do. And this is why a lot of people make requests you know, for videos like this to be made. And it, it can be a little bit con confusing and daunting for people getting started you know, with modeling to implement periodic boundary conditions. Um, because the FEA tools out there, I don't really know of anyone, the commercial FEA tools out there, that has an easy way of implementing this without the user having to create maybe a bespoke plugin that you integrate within the finite element scheme. On Abacus, on, 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 on YouTube, there is a video uh, called Easy PVC, um, a plugin created by, by a YouTuber called um, Easy PVC, which is one of those plugins that can do these things easily. So, but apart from that, it's, it's quite hard to create, uh, implement periodic boundary conditions. And I, and I will explain a little bit why this is so. So now periodic boundary conditions, they tend to be generally used on areas around micromechanics, uh, which is a study of micro scale mechanics behavior of systems. Uh, so at the micro scale, you begin to see the differences maybe between you know, components, the microstructure, as against macro scale where things are homogenized. And so for this, at this micro scale, heterogeneous media is really important. It's about how the component is distributed in a heterogeneous manner. And so periodic boundary conditions tends to be very well useful in that area. So some of the examples are, for example, unidirectional composites, especially at this micro scale, where you can see the fibers. The fibers are essentially the green things and uh, the, you know, the grayish options are, are the, the composites um, that, are, that are there, the, the metrics. So at this scale, 
periodic boundary conditions will be useful as a way of investigating this problem. Another example is a, a soda material that you find in microchip devices. So when they have voids in them, the voice can be quite random. Essentially, spherical voice distributed randomly within the microstructure. And so if you want to model at that scale, it makes sense to use a periodic boundary condition to represent that. And then the final example here is something I've taken from a paper, which is um, foam structure. If you've got a foam structure with its complicated architecture, this will also be true for, let's say, a bone, um, a trabecular bone. So they will always have this kind of complicated architecture. And to use any of the Dirichlet or, Dir or, or Newman boundary condition would not be suitable. A periodic boundary condition would be the best for it. And so this is what, uh, where these things tend to be applied. So if your problem involves looking at a micromechanical level of analysis where the constituents within the domain are clearly defined um, and, and then you want to be able to apply boundary conditions to it, a periodic boundary condition will be the best. The other thing that I need to say about periodic boundary condition is that they tend to lead to quicker convergence of your FEA solution for the same kind of boundary condition applied. So let's say you've got a domain and you're applying either a displacement or a force or a periodic boundary condition. The result will converge better and quicker using a periodic boundary condition. All right, so let's, if you want to read more about this, there is um, a reference book that I would recommend, obviously, clearly this is a book that I, I wrote and Springer published this in 2018. And I really would direct you to chapter eight of this book, especially section 8.34. 8.3.4, which is where I talked extensively about this. So this is the resource. Um, again, look at the link. So if you can please go and look at that, I'll put the link in the comment section for those that are interested. You should find it anywhere in any of these um, uh, commercial and Amazon, any anywhere. It's, it's quite available. Um, so please do consult that, and I think you get a lot of benefit by reading through my discussions on that. Okay, so let's look at, at how what the theory is and how you can actually do this. So. This is an on, on, original on the form representative volume element. What we want to do is to apply some kind of periodic boundary condition. So we end up with a periodic boundary condition deformed RV, which is typically characterized by the mirror image of the faces of the edges. So the, for example, this edge is mirror image to the other edge and this other is mirror image. To the other. So this is the feature you see most of the time with periodic boundary condition. And that's also why some people call it a cyclic boundary condition because of this repetition in terms of the displacement of one face with another face. So the periodic boundary condition essentially stipulates that opposite pairs of edges or surfaces on the boundary of an RV should deform identically under a given loading history. So I've taken this quote from my book. So, and, and this is implication. The two faces must have a uniform or repetitive deformation pattern. And, and that's essentially what it is. And what, how this is done essentially is that you need to have the same displacement applied on one face replicated to the displacement on the other face. Of course, they don't necessarily need to be equal. So for example, here, we've got a displacement moving this way and we've got a displacement moving that way. So this is what we need to do for every node on the system, a corresponding node on the other face must have a corresponding equivalent this uh, deformation this is why you end up having a mirror image of deformation between one face and its parallel opposite face so what is the mathematics so the mathematics of that basically requires you that for let's say this variable okay so for where this is a model parameter which can be displayed it could be temperature could be velocity so the velocity on one face na and mb are basically edge nodes on two kinetically linked opposite edges. So the displacement on one face in the x, y direction must equal to the displacement on another face parallel kinetic, you know, directly opposite to it in the x, y direction, where this um, ohm k is basically an summation of all the, it's basically a reference to one of the boundaries, okay? And K then represents left, right, top, and, and, and bottom or base, however you want to call that. So the principle is that if you're looking at displacement, the displacement of a set of nodes must be equal to the displacement of a kinematically linked opposite edge set of nodes. That's the principle 
the mathematics behind the periodic boundary condition. This is slightly different from a Newman or the Dirichlet, where in the Dirichlet you're saying the displacement has to be equal to a constant, a prescribed constant, or maybe the temperature has to be equal to a prescribed temperature, or the Newman, which says that the derivative with respect to the outward point in normal or on that edge has to be equal to a defined value. But in this case, we are saying a displacement on one phase must be equal to displacement on the other phase. The temperature on one phase must be equal to the temperature on the other phase. The velocity on one phase has to be equal to the velocity on the other phase, and so on and so forth. So it's this idea of one displacement being equal to the other on opposite edges that are kinematically linked. So let's look a little bit more on that. So. The implication of that mathematics is that you would end up having this idea of a periodic or a non-periodic mesh. So for example, let's look at this case. So you got a mesh, so this is a domain, like a, a, a steel plate with three holes in them and it's meshed. So I've taken time to mesh it so that the number of nodes on one edge equal to the number of nodes on the other edge. So if we home in onto a set of nodes, let's say just some of those central nodes, what you will notice is that each node here is kinematically linked and directly opposite to another node on the other point. So that, that, and this, that. So this is important when you are dealing with periodic boundary condition. However, if you think about this other case where there is a different kind of meshing implementation algorithm applied. Now, it's the same plate, but mesh differently. So if I select these three nodes at the center, what you will notice is that the central node here can be linked sort of to any of these three nodes because somehow you have to find a way to connect them because you've got too many nodes here compared to the node on the other end. So this second case is a non-periodic mesh and the first case is a periodic mesh. Okay, so for finite, for periodic boundary condition, especially the content that I'll be discussing today, we want to deal with the periodic meshes. There is a slightly different way of dealing with non-periodic meshes, but it's not the subject of, of the discussion today. So again, I can I'll put on the on the link to a publication between myself and, and one of my students where we talk a little bit how you can deal with non-periodic meshes. But for the videos that I'm making on periodicity, on periodic boundary condition, we'll be using the simple case where you enforce periodicity between one phase and another phase. Okay, so you ensure that one set of nodes on one face must be equal to the set of nodes on the other faces. This is simpler, easier, um, but this one's a little bit more challenging, but you, you can pick that up or maybe in future I can make a video to, to again explain how non-periodic mesh is. If you are interested in this kind of non-periodic mesh argument, so please put that on the content, on the comment section of this video, and then I'll review that and see if there is any interest in this for making videos like that. Okay, so how do we then translate this information between the mesh into the boundary condition so that we can actually run it? And, and the simple thing really is this idea of a canonical equation. A canonical equation is basically an equation of a variable displacement or whatever that has to always be equal to zero. So, and again, I pick up an RV with different microstructural constituents in them. So this could be concrete um, and it currently pinned at this point. So we can identify all these boundary nodes. Okay, so I've selected some nodes and A and B and C and D and then N1234 with also the domains in place. So if we pick up just a set of these internal nodes, so these are called my internal nodes. So these three nodes corresponding to those three nodes and this node corresponding to those nodes. So what we find with this internal edge node is that they are displacement for periodic, for, uh, periodic boundary condition to apply is that the displacement of node B must be equal to the displacement of node C. This is the principle, okay, which we can then convert into a canonical equation which basically is an equation that has to be the right-hand side always zero. So for this to be true, so I'll move A to this side so you end up having this to be equal to zero. The same thing will apply for node C and D. Node C has to be equal to node D in displacement. If we're dealing with temperature, it will be the same. If we're dealing with velocity, it will be the same. So whatever variable you're looking at has to be equal to the variable on the other point. You want them to, to be so that this mirror or repetitive displacement future would, would appear. And so this is what we have there. Okay, so what about the corner nodes? What we call the corner or some publication described as a retained nodes. 
Okay, so the same principle will apply. The displacement of node 2 must be equal to the displacement of node 1. The displacement of node 3 equal to the displacement of node 4. Uh, however, maybe node 4, node 1, so that we can then rearrange it into a canonical equation to have it in this form. So if we implement this across the domain, then everything is fine. We have now told the boundary condition, the FEA solution, FEA, you know, framework that this system has to have this periodicity of displacement which is required for periodic boundary condition now but the problem is that we need to be able to also enforce this displacement okay so to enforce an axial deformation for example or maybe a temperature history at a point we must therefore connect the displacement of the structure to the point where we are actually pulling so remember, we had this edge nodes, edge nodes connected. Then we have this boundary nodes connected. But what happens, or this corner nodes? But what happens if we apply displacement here? How would those edge nodes be aware of the displacement at N2? So somehow we need to link the deformation of the internal edge nodes to the deformation of this retained or corner nodes because the corner nodes are the nodes that we use to instruct the deformation of the structure so that's actually where we're going to apply loads on so what we this will require us to do is first we have to then set remember the canonical equation so if we go back to the canonical equation they are always equal to zero okay they're always equal to zero so invariably this set of equation somehow has to be equal to this because at any rate, they are equal to zero. So this way, we need to make a connection. Basically, by saying, okay, this bit has to be equal to that bit. If we rearrange the equation, we now have an extended canonical equation. We basically say that the node B minus node A will be equal to node C, node 2 minus node 1. Which, if we rearrange in a canonical form, you end up with a relationship that looks like this. So this is for B and A. So it's also will be true for C and D. So node C minus node D would equal to node 4 minus node 1, which will give you this equation. So we have the two sides, which sort of has to be equal. But once we express it in this form, then we are able to say, okay, if node 2 moves a certain distance, every other thing in the model will have a connection. There is a connectivity between them. And so this system will respond accordingly. So this is the... Next form of canonical equation. In fact, this is the form that we will be applying within a final element simulation to impose periodicity on our domain. So this will be true for displacement, as we show here. It will be true for temperature, it will be true for velocity, acceleration, whatever you're trying to use to control angular velocity, control your system. So this will be true for them. But the principle remains that you need to connect the internal edge nodes with this corner or return nodes. All right. So what is the case for Abacus, which is the FEA server that I will use? And it's the same for other FEA tools, but I'm, I'm basically focusing on Abacus in this case as an FEA server. So the canonical equations are introduced into Abacus using a multifunction constraint equation initiated by a command within Abacus called star equation. You will find this under the constraint section of um, the FEA Abacus framework. So this is what we use. And, and what does it entail? So basically, the star equation is a way to translate a canonical equation like this into a command that Abacus can actually understand and implement. So this is a generalized equation. This is a kind of equation that you find in Abacus the documentation. Basically, some coefficient, some constant times displacement of node P in the one direction plus a2, some constant, times displacement in the two direction or y direction of node q, added up. Everything has to be equal to zero because this is the requirement for canonical equation. Now, how do we introduce that? So this is the way it has to be implemented within the Apacus uh, keyword file. So when you implement this equation from the CA environment, what the keyword file will have will be something that looks like this. So where n is the total number of terms that make up this equation. So total number of terms. So if you have 1, 2, then n will be equal to 2. If you have, so here we don't know the number. So a n tells you the total number of terms. P, Q, and R are basically the node numbers. Okay. And then the coefficients 
of these equations are basically these ones written down here. So this is how it has to be written for, for a problem. So let's look at this case that we've been dealing with. Okay, so we've got this case N A N B and C N D and then N1 and N2. So the canonical equation for this that we've derived is basically this N B minus N A minus N2 plus N1 in displacement mode in X and Y direction. So if we then want to implement this within Abacus using this star equation command, this is what we'll have. So and I'll, I'll talk you through it. So basically we've got one, two, three, four, four terms. So first star equation is a command that tells Abacus now expect a canonical equation. Okay. Now how many terms is Abacus going to in interpolate, interpret? Four terms because you've got one, two, three, and four. Now what are the node sets, node levels, node sets for defining these this nodes? Because again, Abacus need to know which node you are referring to that is going to apply appear in the canonical equation. So we've got them here as NA, NB, NA, N2, and N1. So you need to a priori, I label this and, and name them. So this is what we've got here. Okay, so there should be comma, comma here. Okay, then the next set is what are the degrees of freedom? So if we go back to here, so this second one is the degrees of freedom. So what are the degrees of freedom? So what we want to do is that we want Abacus to know what to do if you are deforming this in the x direction. And Abacus speak is a material reference frame of one. So x is equal to 1. So we replace here by 1 because this equation has x terms included. Now, the last bit here is the coefficient of this equation. So the quotient of this is 1. The quotient of this is minus 1, minus 1, and then plus 1. So that's why we have 1, minus 1, minus 1, and plus 1. Okay? So this is what you get. So this canonical equation only tells Abacus the connection between these edge nodes with this returned or corner nodes in the translational x direction. So there is no awareness yet of what will happen in the y direction. And because this is purely boundary condition, this node can actually move or it can move down depending on what the history of material around it, what the stiffness is around it. So it can move and depending also on the displacement. So we need to also tell Abacus what will happen to that node if there is a potential Y displacement associated with its deformation. And so what do we do? We replicate exactly the same star equation, but now we introduce the Y direction. So by replacing the 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 that represent the X axis with 2, 2, 2, 2 that represent the Y axis. So for just this node alone, for this combination, can I click? linked node alone, we have two canonical equations, two star equations within Abacus that tells it what to do in terms of periodicity of the formation. And this is what we have here. Okay. If you have other ways, so there are other things, other ways of doing dealing, dealing with this. But for now, this is how we're going to be dealing with this problem for, for now. Okay. So this would then be the y degrees of freedom. Now, this can will automatically be created for you within the final element code once you use the plugin. I'll talk about this in, an, in another video, you know, where I talk about the manual implementation and automatic implementation. Again, please look out for them in the cards um, and, and see where these videos will help you. Now, so we've got those two. What we then need is to somehow introduce them within the Nabakus keyword file. So this is a typical Nabakus keyword file with heading, with parts, with nodes, with elements end part now there is the assembly section so within the assembly section we need to take the content of what we have here and populate that region so this is what abacus does or you can do this manually once you've written out this you know in a text editor like notepad you can copy them and paste it into this environment to basically tell abacus yes this is my updated periodic boundary condition aware um, keyword file Okay, again, in the next video that I'm talking about, you will see more about this. Also, you need to remember that you also have to create those nodal set. Abacus need to know what nodes you are talking about. So, node A, node B, node 1, node 2, you need to be aware of that. Here, I've put A and B because I haven't put a node number. So, you need to know the actual node number there and put it there rather than A and B. It will not accept A and B, it will accept an integer. 
okay of some kind um so this is just for illustrative purpose so first the upper section is about where you create the nodal set the lower section is where you create the canonical equations and once you've done that then you're ready um to run the model and then there's periodicity and boundary condition implemented so finally i just want to encourage you to look out for the next two videos that show how you can actually do this manually and automatically this video has simply been on the theory of pbc using finite element modeling i think it's essential to talk about this theory first so that when you start looking at the other videos you would be able to understand why i'm you know going about it in the way that I'm, I'm going about it so thank you for your interest in this video um, again if you like this kind of content please do subscribe to to this channel and click the notification button so that when content like this are made um, you'll be the first to see it please do also like the video um, so that people more and more people will be aware of it and the youtube algorithm will be pushing it up so that more people would see it thank you very much for your interest again watch out for the two videos on the cards that will tell you a bit more about um, how you can implement this both manually and automatically. Thank you and bye. See you in the next video.